Okay, so my name's Norman Barker. Um, I work for IBM. Um, until recently, I was working for Cloudant, and Cloudant were acquired by IBM about 18 months ago. And we're going to be talking today about geospatial big data. Um, I'm, an a I'm an active open source developer, both to CouchDB, Lispatial Index, GDAO. I've done some work with PostGIS and Map Server in the past. I also have a tendency to speak very, very quickly. So if you can't understand me, just raise your hand and I'll slow down. And I welcome questions during, during the presentation, not necessarily at the end. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I thought it would be useful because CouchDB is quite new. Certainly CouchDB with GA or CouchDB with GIS is very, very new. So I'll give a brief history of that. And then we're going to go in. I targeted it at, yes, as a beginner's presentation, even though we're going to go into quite some depth on what is big data and how to scale out big data. We're going to talk about NoSQL or NoSQL. And then we're going to start having a dive into how you do distributed databases. So from a very high level, we're going to talk about consistent hashing, how to do sharding. What is the CAT theorem? You know, how do we prove it? Why is it useful? What does it mean for CouchDB? What does it mean for other databases such as Oracle or Postgres? Then we're going to talk about its multi-master architecture. Rather than having a master slave, everything is a master. So we're going to have a dive into that. And then we're going to take a classical GIS example of doing an image classification and show how you could do that in a traditional way or how you could do it with CouchDB. And then we're going to talk a bit more about our open source development with this spatial index and GEOS. So CouchDB is a NoSQL JSON document store with MapReduce. And it was originally developed by Damien Katz when he was working for IBM about six, seven years ago. He then spun it off and formed his own company called Couchbase. The company I, I work for, Cloudant, they started shortly after Couch, Couchbase, and they were more of a scientific company. We came from the Large Hadron Collider. But we're now a very large and diverse community all across the world. It's written in Erlang, which is a very obscure language that only people who know telecoms really tend to use. But it's highly fault tolerant and gives you high availability. Originally, there was just GeoCouch, and they've seen full text indexes for secondary search. So you had MapReduce over B-Tree, and you could go and do a text analysis with the scene, or you could do a simple bounding box over an R-Tree. Primarily, we store JSON or GeoJSON formats, but we can also store indoor JSON. It's an unstructured database. You can store whatever you want. So with Cloudant's rolling this, or IBM's rolling this now, we donated BigCouch to enable clustering of CouchDB. So CouchDB was originally a cluster of unreliable commodity hardware, but before it had cluster, it was just ouch. And now we cluster its couch. So you can run a DBAS on top of CouchDB, which is what we do as an operational service. And we can go and cluster that across multiple data centers or down to your mobile device. So we're talking now a bit about what is NoSQL. NoSQL really is just unstructured text. And this text is represented within couch as JSON. So you don't have a schema on write. You have a schema on read. And hopefully that text is big enough down the bottom that you can see it's a view on your database, so you're writing that inside as a JavaScript function. And then I'm enforcing that if the doc is a geometry, I know it's a geospatial uh, JSON document. I know that actually it's GeoJSON. I can go and index that document. So on write, you can write whatever you want. And it's on read that you're pulling out that data. And the key thing here is that every index within CouchDB is incremental. So you're not rebuilding that index all the time. It's just on a single update to that database. So every time I add a document, I increment by one, and that index is incremented by one. So the fundamental way that we go and do our distributed databases is something, something called consistent hashing. And this is based on the Amazon Dynamo model. Data is too large to go and fit on a single node, you know, fit onto a single server. It could be many, many terabytes. So let's spread it across multiple servers. But how do we do this in a, like, an efficient manner so that if a node goes down, I can go and stand up another node without having to go and rescale my whole database, rescale my whole cluster? So a DB, a database, is the collection of partitions. And those partitions are assigned. So when the data comes in, you're assigned to a partition, assigned to a node by doing a hash of that doc ID. Could be a hash of the whole document, but you know, let's make it fast and simple and do a hash of the doc ID. Here you can see it's a CRC64 hash, or it could be a CRC32 hash. It really depends on the range of your cluster. So I'm doing a hash. I'm writing to that data to, to a couple of nodes, and I'm writing that data to another couple of nodes. So you can see there on the diagram, my data is going to, say, nodes 1, 2, and 3, 4, 5, and 6, 7, 8, and 9, 10, 11, 12. And then I'm going to explain how you can go and resize your cluster as needed. OK. So we have consistent hashing. 
but we also need data redundancy. We, we need to guarantee that your data will be there. So we do that with a quorum model. So the quorum here, I have n equals 3, w2, i equals 2. So I'm going to have n copies of my data when I come in to do a write. So node 2, node 3, node 4 in the example. When I do a write, I want to hear back from two of those nodes. When I do a read to go and return that result, I want to hear back from two of those nodes. It's, it's a good way to go and make sure that you don't have to hear from every database. You only have to hear from the nodes, and then you're going to get a very fast response. Okay, so we're talking about geo. So we talked about CRC32 hash, and we talked about CRC64 hash, but actually a geo hash is a consistent hash as well. You know, a geo hash is just a Morton key, or depending on where you're educated, a Morton value. And it's just a way of assigning geometries to different nodes. So if my data is static, you know, if I'm not moving in time, so I'm not an aircraft, I'm not a UAV, why not use a geo hash? That means according to the geometry of a document coming in, I can go and send it to a particular node in my cluster. So that could be a data privacy issue, for example. I could just want to send this to a particular region. You know, I want to keep all the data in North America, keep all my European data in Europe. Or I could actually want to design my spatial index to have hotspots. If I have hotspots in my spatial index, it can actually be more efficient. So I could say, everything in this locality needs to go here, so my R tree is better. And then I just had a, a fancy diagram on the bottom to show how you do a geohash over the whole world and how the colors map. So the fundamental to CouchDB is the CAT theorem. And this is where we differ a lot from Oracle and Postgres and other relational databases, is that we're not transactional. So the CAT theorem says you can have two of these, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So you can only pick two. And the way you prove this is with the classical proof by contradiction. So you're probably familiar with that. How do you show that the square root of two is an irrational number? you assume it's rational and then pre prove it it can't be. So couch DB, we picked availability and partition tolerance. That means that we can't enforce consistency. You know, we don't, we're not a transactional system. When you do a write, you can't guarantee that every node in your cluster is going to have an exact copy of that data when you return. We're an eventually consistent system. That means that any user is guaranteed to have a copy of that data at any point in time. If a network node goes down, my other node is going to handle it. So east and west coast, for example. If east coast goes down, my load balancer is going to route to the west coast. So what are the benefits of eventually consistent systems? Is that it gives you a multi-master system. You don't have a single, single point of write. You don't have a master-slave architecture. You have multi-master. And the way you synchronize that data is with a sequence called the changes feed. So I retrieve an ID and a revision for every feature within my database. I can pair that to my local copy. If I differ, I raise my hand and say I differ. If I don't, I just take the write. Because it's multi-master, I certainly enable data collection to be both online and offline. So I'm a field worker. I go out into the field. I collect my data. I'm also a master. And then my server is also a master, and I synchronize between the two. I mean, you can have policies in place to go and regulate that data, but in conceptually, you can do that. So how do we handle big data? Well, we don't go and say, have a single like an Oracle server or have a single Postgres server, we're saying your big geodata is distributed. You know? I'm also a big data collector, my server's a big data collector, and I'm mashing that data all between them all. So I wanted to show you that. This is an example that we'll be showing tonight. Um, so it's a Tesla board on the right, and it's an Android client on the left. And I'm currently offline, and I'm receiving the temperature and humidity, say, in this room. And I'm writing offline to my tablet, I come back online, my Android device is a master, and I'm going to sync that data up into the cloud and across the east and the west and into Europe. So this is distrib distributed big geodata. So that looked pretty hard because that was Android, or it could have been iOS, and the libraries for that are all open source too, they're C++ and Java. But PouchDB is a CouchDB model that runs in open source JavaScript database, so inside WebSQL index DB. So Safari, Firefox, and Chrome, and it can run offline. And it can sync with CouchDB, with Cloud, and it can sync with the cloud. So here we have a basic leaflet map. And in this case, I pulled in a geo package when I was offline, and I'm rendering the buoys over Monterey Bay. If I, to go, if I went out to the field, I could change that data and then sync that back up to the master. But the key thing is I'm offline, and I'm running that, running that in my web browser. So 
So here we show how a data center replication works. And the reason why we want to do yes, so again, we're eventually consistent, we're not consistent. So according to the CAT theorem, we picked partition tolerance and availability for CouchDB. I have high availability, and I can handle a high velocity of input data. So I can do a write here. In this case, I'm writing to the east coast from my mobile device. In that case, to the west, to the south, and then down to South America, across the Europe by Duxa, and then wherever that is, Russia, I guess. So let's talk about a traditional GIS example. So we actually had to do this for a customer with some uh, uh, sensitive data for an insurance company. So I tried to make this an abstract example. So the input is a large GeoTIFF file where the pixel values represent a data class. So it could be water, could be vegetation, for example. I could want to find all the water bodies. So it's been a flooding. I had a recent pass over my satellite. Find me all the water bodies. Traditionally, I'd use MVGrass or GDAL and export that shapefile per class and overlay onto a map. You know, then I'd pass that map around all, all my community around this. And then, quite possibly, I'd go and store those results inside a web feature service, WFS. So, wh what would we do in CouchDB? Well, we split the image into tiles, and you could have done that in the previous example too. I mean, that would speed things up. And then we process the classes as vectors, exactly the same as before. And then, just here as a note, um, I don't think many people are using Potrace, but it's an excellent way you can do that um, for asset to vector utility. Um, we tried using uh, GDAL Polygonize, tried using a few commercial tools, and Potrace was the fastest. The nice thing about Potrace is, is it exports as GeoJSON, and then from, from that, we can go and install that inside CouchDB. So we have these gone up to one node, three copies of the data for data redundancy. I've heard back from two writes. So data is now highly available, redundant, and distributed over the whole world. That means as a user, as an analyst, I can go and retrieve that data. Now, if I'm in the field and I've received that image classification of water bodies, I might want to say, OK, no, actually, you know, that water subsided now since that satellite passed, that water's changed. I can go and edit that class. And then using MVCC, so multi-version concurrency control, because I'm a master, I can push back to the server and go and get those data changed. So eventual consistency sounds like a really bad idea because we're all used to transactional systems. I want to do a write, and I want everyone to see that data, because that data must be authoritative. But actually, that's not always the case, and you don't always need that. I'd rather have a copy of the data than no data at all. So if I was at sea, for example, and I was offline, I'd rather have a copy of the data, even if it was out of date. And then when I came online, I'd go and receive an update to that data file. Oh, there, you can see that. It doesn't look very good on my monitor. So I want to talk about geospatial indexes and big data because I think we're all very used to using either an R tree or an R star tree, and we use that for everything. But there are other ways to go and use geospatial indexes for big data. A distributed spatial index is always going to be slower on writes because you're writing across the network to multiple nodes. So the only way you can go and improve the performance is to make the reads very, very quick. So if you look on the left there, you have an R tree. So the way an R tree works is you have the minimum bounding rectangles of your geometries, and you're storing those in a hierarchy as an index. Is, that means your writes are very, very quick. It's very easy to go in and sit on top of an R tree. You know, you might want to do some reordering, but it's still very, very quick. Whereas with an R star tree, you're taking that step when you're doing the write to go and minimize the overlaps of your minimum bounding rectangles. That means your writes might be slightly slower, but your reads are ve very, very quick because you're traversing less of the index. So with a distributed database, you really want that. You want to be the less reversal you can do because you're going across the network, the better. So we can actually be in cloud and we use an R star tree. So I've seen lots of people trying to use an R star tree or an R tree for temporal indexes. So you're doing a geospatial, and you do something linear in time, like some B tree, for example, and you do, or you're doing a Lucene text for time, for example. But you want to be using the right index for the job, so use a temporal spatial index. Um, <laughs> So the well-known ones out there are the TPR star tree and the MVR star tree. TPR is for future predictive, and MVR is for historical. So I'm doing historical time with, with a geospatial query. And the example that we like um, for TPR is for, for routing. So a TPR is taking a trajectory. So I'm here. Where am I going to be in time t? My trajectory is from t0 to t2, right? So I'm storing that trajectory. I'm not storing every point in between. So I could be going on that trajectory for the next 20 minutes or so. That's what I'm storing, the trajectory and the time that you're going to be on that level. So when I'm doing routing with a TPR tree, I can say my segment here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I'm storing the trajectory between those. 
That means my index is very, very small. So my query speed is very, very quick. So that's a way to handle temporal big data. So we're about 15 minutes right now, so I have to stay down a bit. So please do jump in with any questions. So Couchly being Cloudant, we have a primary database, and your primary index is a B tree, as it was map reduced, but you also have secondary geospatial indexes. And the way we do those is we're using the open source library list spatial index. And we're giving it a good overhaul, and we're active contributors with uh, Howard Butler and with Marios. So we're enabled an R star tree, an MVR tree for historical temporal queries, and a TPR tree for temporal predictive queries. Then we also use LibGeos for all our geometry calculations. But that might, might change because we're quite interested in doing a bit more 3D work. And then as a change from most people who are using Proj4, we use CSMAP for our projections. And the reason for that is that we needed a very accurate um, a radius query, so that when you did a radius query, that you're actually using the ellipsoid of the Earth, you know, this Earth Vizanti algorithm. And then we also use Couch, Big Couch, and the reason we use Big Couch is for the clustering. You will now find that in CouchDB, so if you go to the trunk of CouchDB, you'll find that CouchDB is cluster enabled. And then we're also doing a lot of work with synchronization, so it's multi master. You can do that with Couch, you can do that with Cloud. And so I'm collecting my data in the field, I want to sync between my device, and I want to sync between the server, and I want to replicate that over the whole world. So, what is Geo Big Data Summary? So, this is very much from a CouchDB view, so this whole talk has been from the perspective of a CouchDB developer, CouchDB user, not necessarily a post-GIS user or an Oracle Spatial user. Data can and should be distributed. You know, I don't need to have a single node. I don't need to have a single data center. I can have multiple data centers, and I can have everyone collecting data. When you're, because big data is huge, you only want to stay, sync significant data between masters. So on my device, I want to be recording when I have a significant event. You know, the temperature might have really dipped and my house is going to freeze. That's a significant event. I want to sync that event. I don't want to be syncing all the data through the day. We're a, a multi-master database that is eventually consistent. So again, that means eventually I'm going to get a copy of the data. doesn't mean I'll get it immediately, but normally in practice, and we find this with our customers, it's within an order of a millisecond or two. Secondary indexes enable complex queries over a NoSQL database. So even though my database is unstructured, I can apply structure to that database on read. So I can do a geospatial query on an unstructured database by enforcing that the only data I put into my index is GeoJSON that I recognize. I could have multiple data formats in there. I could have a sensor or I could have a feature. I don't even be picking out the feature. And then we find lots of people are using us as a way to archive their data. So they're going to be doing lots and lots of writes. They have lots and lots of users. So we use a cluster to archive data. So I think this is the page that we could spend a bit more time on. And that's issues. So within geospatial systems, we commonly assume that it's going to be a transaction. You know, we're not used to an eventually consistent model. We, we assume that everything's going to be transactional. You know, that needs to change. Even within implementations of a feature service, that's assumed to be a transaction. Um, we're working to try and add both a revision model on top of WFS. So you have your identifier for the transaction, but you can also have a, a revision hierarchy as well. So feature data is OK for MVCC, because it's typically small, smallish. You know, and it's easy to do a diff and see what's changed. But what do we do about big raster data, which is typically gigabytes in size, multiple gigabytes? So you could have JPEG 2000, for example, or GeoTIFF, or HDF, or anything. So I think the things that we need to consider there is doing more of an image streaming model. So we're just streaming segments of that data. So at the moment, we're all assuming that we're doing revisions on tiles. Well, let's try and do revisions on wavelet compressed data as well. Then the versioning. Um, I think this is something that GeoGig is working on. It's something that we're actively working on as well. Um, we're doing a lot of work with the AGC right now on GeoPackage, and that's something we're going to try and do. So you can sync between a GeoPackage, and you can go and sync uh, up to a cloud. So if we go back to this slide here, which I seem to have missed out on. Here. OK. <coughs> we have a GeoPackage there on the bottom right-hand corner with Cloud and CouchDB and PouchDB. So we're showing that you can do a synchronization from a SQLite file up to CouchDB, up to Cloud, and, and back over to Pouch. OK, so I, I finished early. I said I'd be fast. So let's have time for some questions. But first, I'd like to invite you to the, the Birds of a Feather tonight, which is between 7.30 and 9.30 at San Pablo CDA, where Raj at the back there will be giving a good presentation. And the, the key thing to note is that it's going to be beer and food there, too. So.
Um, any questions? Sure. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so, yeah. So we we put OSM into CouchDB or OSM into Cloudant, and we go and scale it out by adding horizontal nodes. So we scale horizontally. So we're just going to add more nodes until you get the performance that you want. Because you know we're a cluster of commodity hardware, so each node is very very cheap. And we just go and add more and more and more to scale. Uh, I think it's when you want data availability. So when you want users to always have a copy of your data, you want to distribute your data, as opposed to having a single box that you have to manage and make sure is up 24-7. If you distribute your data, you don't have, you don't have that, quite that concern. Sure. Okay, so this is very new. So we're doing this part of AWS 11, the OGC experiment. So Geo packages of SQLite file, as you know, and we're adding a, as an ID for your feature, and we're adding a revision to that as well. So a revi revision identifier. So you have the, the concept you need of an ID and a rev. You can now go and sync that to Pouch because all Pouch needs is an ID and a rev as well. So if I go and edit my Geo package, I'm going to increment that rev, and I'm going to do a sync back to Pouch or to Couch. Oh, and that's, uh, that's actually a GDAO driver, so you can go and use that now. Any other questions? Cool, well, thank you for your time, and uh, both Raj and I will be at the Birds of the Feather tonight, so come and ask us any questions you might have.